Perhaps you still have your finger in 1 Kings chapter 17. And if not, let's go there again as we'll look to God's Word this morning. One of the lines that we've been using to describe our series of studies has been a statement that most of you, if you've been paying attention, should have been uh, memorizing by now. But it's a threefold phrase, which is good for us to be reminded of again here today, because this series in the book of Kings, first and second Kings, reminds us of a faithful God ministering to a faulty people. At least three of you got marks on that one. A faithful God ministering to a faulty people, that's us, with a promise of future hope. In reality, that's the narrative of the scriptures, the, the complete, complete content of the Bible, as it were. That God is faithful and he's working amongst faulty people like us, fallen yet redeemed. And he has a message of future hope that we long for and look forward to one day. And the beauty of that statement, at least one level, is that we discover it here in the Old Testament. In the times of the kings, in very difficult, turbulent, challenging times, times of warriors, times of idolatry, times of, of great miracles of God, this is happening because God is working amongst a faulty people for a future hope. And we, the people of God today, understand that in greater measure, if you will, than those in the Old Testament because we have the full reminder of Scripture, Old and New Testament, to speak to us in this way. That we might hear God and, and know his will for our lives. And at the outset, I want us to keep that in mind today. If, if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, if, if you don't know him, you might be religious or a churchgoer or whatever. But if you haven't truly been transformed in your life by the sovereign electing grace of God, then I want you to hear this. God is all powerful. We're going to learn that today. God is a God of judgment and wrath. And we'll see some of that today. But God is also a God of mercy and grace. Throw yourself upon his mercy. And through Jesus Christ, know his love to you. And we who are his children, oh, I pray desperately that the Spirit would be speaking to us through his word. As I was going through this text this week, and I kind of went all over the page. Where do we go with Elijah? Because he's such a familiar story for the children. I'm sure I could have any of the kids here come up and tell me about the widow's oil and, and the ravens feeding and all those, those things they've learned. But Lord, there's, there's a message of hope that you have for us here as well. And one we need to hear because it's biblical truth. Our purpose here is to come to 1 Kings 17 to discover in the life of Elijah the power of Almighty God and the glory that is due to him. And that he uses faulty people to bring about his purposes, sovereignly working in us in this way. Now, when you come to 1 Kings 17, and I just want to give some of the context here. You have an idea of where we've been, if you've been following our series, The Time of the Kings. And we got through the first nine or so kings in Judah and Israel. We have a whole lot more to learn about the kings, all right? They're still to come. But now you come to chapter 17, and really from here all the way into, well, chapter, 2 Kings, probably chapter 12, is the time of significant prophetic ministry. In fact, Tom Schreiner has a great biblical theology, and he outlines Kings, 1 Kings, in this way. And this section he calls the conflict with Baal worship. And it's significant that he does that because it reminds us here that this whole section, and we're just getting an introduction today, this whole next section of Kings is really this conflict between the true God and the false God of Baal. You can see this as that climactic struggle between the only wise and true God who created all things and the false gods made up in the images and minds of humanity. You already know who's going to win. <laughs> but we want to see here God teaching us these lessons here. Because this is a message of hope through the prophetic word. Now, just a couple words as we begin, for myself, not a prophet. But the significance of the prophetic ministry is very key here. You can go back already in Kings, we've heard from prophets. Sometimes they're referred to as, quote, a man of God. We also have prophets that are fallen prophets earlier on. We had a, an old prophet who wasn't prophesying properly. But the prophetic ministry that God brings to us here is a reminder that God is speaking, listen, through his servants. And in this way, for Elijah particularly, of course, the unlikely battle that he has against Ahab and his prophets of Baal. 
It is a titanic struggle, one that God has already sovereignly purposed to win and has secured that victory between the true God and the idols of this world. But don't get too far ahead. This battle is not unlike what we face in our day and age today. We are facing this struggle, and we don't want to be overly dramatic, but it is dramatic that we live in a world full of idolatry, full of those who rebel against God, who snub their nose at their Creator. Some of you might be watching today and others here. We have rebelled against our Creator, and we worship the idols of this world, whatever they might be. Anything that takes a place greater than that of God is our idol. And that's the struggle we have today. And, and listen very carefully. It's the Word of God that speaks to that struggle. It's a reminder that God is in control and a reminder that one day we will either know Him through Jesus Christ and be ushered into His presence or we will stand under Him in judgment because we have not listened to the prophetic Word. And so the most important thing for us today, of course, in this is to have these ears that hear. Not just sense the audible voice that I have. I don't want you to so much hear my voice, hear the scriptures as they speak and that God might change that. And so you have Elijah, then we'll see Elisha in about three chapters later, we'll come into the coming on of Elisha himself. These two great prophets, not the only ones, but they're the ones highlighted here. And we need to get a sense of really who is Elijah. So let's just remember Elijah himself. Elijah, we're gonna hear about him in a moment, but he lived in the ninth century BC. He was part of the northern kingdom of Israel. You remember uh, as we studied that, the southern divided kingdom of Judah, the northern one of Israel. Elijah comes out of Israel itself, and his life itself becomes very, very problematic right away. His name means basically that uh, Yahweh is my God, or the God, I am the servant of Yahweh, Yahweh is my God. This is the idea of his name, which will certainly stand him out when he gets to meet Ahab and his wonderful darling wife Jezebel. We'll learn about her later on as well. But Elijah is this one that stands out. He's very significant because, of course, we see him referred to in the New Testament a number of times. The Matthew's Gospel, the Transfiguration, when Jesus is there, is transfigured, and there's Moses and Elijah. And so in many ways, Elijah is Moses reborn, as it were, in this picture here. And the reminder that people are waiting for him in the future, the, the reminders here from God's word is the significance of Elijah. He's just one of only two humans that never faced death. What's the other one? Enoch. Enoch, very good. Yes, right to the top. Elijah and Enoch never tasted death. Ushered into heaven, Elijah through the whirlwind. So he's a major player, if you will, in the prophetic ministry and certainly in the canon of scripture, he stands out. What we're going to learn today and over the next several weeks, not just about Elijah, but these things specifically about him, that he really is a spiritual giant. That because of his life, because of what he accomplishes through the power of God, he is what I would call a spiritual giant. So we should pay attention. Secondly, he is very much a man like Moses and like John the Baptist. I say that, and I've mentioned that already with Moses, because these in the New Testament become very key names in the history of Christianity, if you will, of those who stand out and should be taken notice of. But the third thing here is he's also a man just like us. We'll see that in James chapter 5 because James says that. He's just like you and me. Yes, he was a called prophet. We're not prophets in the line of Elijah at all. But he was a human being and he was just like us. And keep that in mind as well. When we talk about the power of God and what he accomplishes, we're talking about that in the context of faulty people like you and like me. That God chooses to work his power through people just like us, as Elijah, as you and I. And so this is not a message for us just to kind of hear and put on the shelf, but this is a message that speaks to the very attitude and life of a believer, that I'm actually fulfilling the purpose of God in my life for his glory. So that's all kind of introductory to get us to that point. We'll learn more about Elijah as we go through this. But there are three specific areas of Elijah's life that I want us to notice here in chapter 17, this familiar text of scripture. And the first is this. We see something of the power of God through the prophet's proclamation. Verse 1. The prophet's proclamation. He speaks. Verse 1 says, Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe tells us where he's from in Gilead. He says to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, 
There'll be neither dew nor rain in the few years, next few years, except at my word. Now, there's a couple of things to notice about Elijah. First of all, he tends to come out of nowhere. There's no preliminary saying, okay, here comes Elijah or anything like that. He's just there. Doesn't tell us about how God called him or where he brought him from, except his locale. He comes out of nowhere. But the second is that, and this is important, he speaks for God. He is the mouthpiece of the sovereign God. And so you'll see that in that verse. As the Lord of God, Israel lives, whom I serve, there'll be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except in my word. God is speaking through him. So he confronts Ahab in this reminder that God is going to do something great. Now, get the picture here. Elijah is a man called of God who brings forth a message that is the, is the most unpalatable message you could have in his day because it's a message against probably the, the most wicked and powerful man of his day. The enemy is great. You don't believe me? Go back to chapter 16 for a moment. In verse 29. Go down to verse 30. This is when Ahab becomes king. Just read what it says. Verse 30 of chapter 16. Ahab, son of Omri, look, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. Now you have to read all the chapters before that to see how wicked the kings were. The idolatry, the sacrificial systems to false gods and so on. Ahab was worse, did more than he did. Look at verse 31. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbel, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. He has completely left the worship of the one true God and now worships his wife's God, Baal. So this is significant. He speaks to the one man who could probably take his life. But he does so boldly. And the message is significant as well. Because he speaks about taking away the rain. We'll get to this later perhaps. But it's likely that he does it this way. God uses it this way because Baal was the god of fertility. He's the god of the plants and makes things grow. He's setting up this struggle, right? He says, okay, you don't have any rain for three years. Over three years. We'll see who's truly God after this. And so he sets up this encounter in a wonderful way, speaks boldly. But notice here with uh, Elijah, the significance of his obedience to the command. It reminds us here, and we'll see this, that, that he was very much a man of prayer. That he prepared himself for this. And we'll learn this later, that he, he listens to God. He cries out to God. He's a man of prayer, seeking the Lord to follow his commands. But not only that, of course, he knows his God. He's not just speaking the word of God, but he knows this God. In fact, further to that, of course, he really knows and has the awareness of God's presence. Elijah, as we'll learn, is a man who is very much understanding, in the limited prophetic human way, the character of his holy God. And he feeds off his presence. Now, this is not to say that Elijah is always perfect. He's a man. Later on, he sits in the desert and whines because I'm the only one left and what's going to happen? I've been so faithful. He has some of that kind of whining that goes on. God deals with that later on. But he's a man who knows the presence of God. Let's, let's just take a moment to let that settle in and to the message that Elijah is bringing. I just jotted this down last night. I thought this is helpful for me at least. He, to, I said this, that, that when you're called by God to speak, pray and go big. Trust the Lord to lead you. When you are called by God to speak the truth of his word, pray and go big and trust the Lord to lead you. The reason I put it in that way is that God expects us to cry out to him, to strengthen us, to encourage us, to give us that which we declare about his word. We pray, and then when God says speak, we don't do it quietly. We don't do it a limited way. We go big, boldly, not in our strength, but through the word of God himself. Has God not promised to speak through his servants? Of course he has. Has God not promised to use us to declare his glory in this world? Absolutely. 
Has he not, if we look in the New Testament context, given us the command of Scripture to take the gospel, the Great Commission, Matthew 28? Has he done that? Of course he has. Then we don't go quietly. We will say with tact and grace and whatever else you want, thus saith the Lord. Not thus saith Pastor Les or your favorite radio preacher. No, 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 no. Not even thus I say. This is what God says. It's also a good reminder that when we speak, speak the truth of God's word, not the truth according to your own agenda. That's often what we do. We might want people to conform to something or do this, and we speak what we say is truth, but it's our truth, it's what we want. God gave us his word because he knows what we need. God gave us his word, which is truth, so that we might speak about him and do it big because we trust him to lead us. Don't flinch at the size of the enemy, but go in the strength of the Lord. And that leads me to the next point out of verse 1. Verses 2 to 16 is the next larger section. And I would suggest this is where we learn about the power of God through the prophet's provision. God's power is shown as he provides for Elijah. Now, this is his servant. He's called him to speak to Ahab. God has a plan right in place. God knows what he's doing. Elijah only knows what God tells him to do. And so he says, go tell Ahab this. And now he's going to show his wonderful care for the next three years. Because remember, that's not, the rain doesn't cover another three and a half, close to three and a half years. You have that in chapter 18, when we talk about the, that Ahab is going to hear from Elijah again. So he's going to provide for him. And you see it in two unique ways. Verses 2 down to verse 6, he's fed by the ravens. So look where he goes here. He goes from this Kareth ravine, and it tells us here he goes now to another place called Zarephath. We get that later on. We'll go through the Kareth regime, ravine in verses 2 to 6, and then he'll go see the, the widow in verses 7 to 16. So notice how he's fed by the ravens. Goes to this ravine, there's a little brook there, and he drinks from the brook, he's camping out, and God sends ravens morning and evening providing meat and bread. Now, great provision, you can look at all the symbolism of these unclean ravens who are feeding him and so on. But he's getting this food, not dissimilar to what God did in the wilderness for the nation of Israel when they wandered, bringing the manna from heaven and then feeding him in wonderful ways with the quail. But here it is. He's fed night and day, which would be very much in contradistinction, of course, to the rest of the country because they're going to have a drought, it says. But God keeps providing for him in this way. A unique and wonderful way to show the provision of God to his servant. But that's not all that he does here. Because as Israel suffers through this drought and Baal's credibility is being questioned, God begins to provide for his servant. It's a clear example of God's sovereignty. Who else could feed someone in this way? There's no Uber Eats or whatever else we might use today to call. But this is fantastic. God sends the birds. Here's your breakfast. Here's your dinner. You're all taken care of. It just shows us further about the character of our God and the sovereign way he provides for his children. But it gets better, doesn't it? Picking up in verse 17, uh, we have Elijah move from that point to the place of Zarephath. Now, again, this is more significant. Remember, Elijah comes from Israel. Now, what God is doing is moving Elijah further away from Ahab. He doesn't want him to be in Ahab's wheelhouse right now. He wants Ahab to stew a lot and suffer. So he's taken him to this, this ravine. The brook dries up. God says, now go to the town of Zarephath, which was probably a Phoenician city, which would be along the coast uh, of the Mediterranean, going up that way, probably uh, 14 miles, I think they say, from Tyre. So it's north there. It's out of Israel's territory. It's into the hotbed of Baal worship. In fact, it's right in the area of where Jezebel comes from. So he's going from further away from Ahab, but into the fire, as it were, and the danger zone. Well, you know the account, what's before us here. He says, go to Zarephath, this little town, and I have dictated that a woman will be there, a widow, to provide for you. He goes there, sees the woman. God has somehow opened his eyes to see this is the woman. Please get me a drink. She goes to get that. And by the way, when you get the drink, please a piece of bread. And that's where we bring that, uh, that interjection of conversation. Well, listen, I don't have any bread. I have a bit of oil and a bit of flour. And then the heartbreak, right? I'm just going home now, collecting some sticks to make a fire 
cook a little bit of bread for my son and I, and then we'll die. Remember, there's a drought going on. There's no food. People are dying. And she's facing death. Well, I'm going to die. He says, well, trust me. I serve the Lord. Go do what I asked, and everything will be fine. Of course, you know what happens here, right, kids? She goes home. She makes it. And what happens? The flower pot never goes empty. The oil pot never goes empty. There's always enough every day, and they eat very well for all of this time. Again, God's provision of his servant. And why should this surprise us? It's wonderful how God dictates things here. Go back to the text. Look at verse 12. She said, As surely as the Lord your God lives, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. The reminder that she's got nothing. We're going to die. This is the last meal that we're going to have. And yet God, through the servant, provides for her in wonderful, wonderful ways. Look at verse 15. She went away and did as Elijah told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. The jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. So everything is falling into place for God to show his power. He provides for Elijah through the ravens. He provides for Elijah, this woman and her son, through the uh, unrelenting use of the oil pot and the flour they're taking care of. It shows us again of God's provision for those he chooses to work through for his glory. He's caring for the needs of his prophet. And again, this should not surprise us. For God has control over all these things. This is Lord Jehovah we're talking about here. But reminder, keep in the back of your mind, this is all of what God is showing us. He's setting up the, the, the big struggle that's going to happen in chapter 18. But all along here, he's preparing Elijah for this great task. I think it's important for us to see the reality of this for us. Because in serving the Lord, as the prophet does, we will face very difficult times. I mean, we just have to look at the last year, right? And, and all the challenges of doing ministry and serving the Lord. But it's in the tough times of service that we rely upon the God who controls all things, even the basic needs of our lives. We serve the Lord faithfully in the most difficult times because he is the one who will provide for our needs. That doesn't mean that we're going to have all the things that we want. It doesn't mean, as some of the health and wealth prosperity gospel gurus will say, just believe and promises will come and you'll get whatever you want. That's not what the Bible ever teaches, and so don't believe it. But God will provide all of our needs in the abundance of his own pleasure for us. Is that not true? We will not lack anything that God doesn't desire for us. And we trust him to care for his servants. This is another reminder of the power of God to work in his children. But we could spend more time there, but I want to go to the last section of our text here for a couple of minutes this morning, verses 17 to 24, where we see now the prophet's power. We have the provision, we have his proclamation, no rain for three and a half years until my word comes again. We see the provision of God to his servant, and now the power comes forth. And it's this wonderful, very difficult challenge, if you will, when the son of this woman dies. Notice that section of verse 17 to 24. Verse 18 shows the difficulty for the woman. It says, she said to Elijah, what do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? These are very piercing words, aren't they? Did you come here just to show me being a non-Israelite my sin and, and kill my family? Has all of this been going on, just part of your strange plan to inflict injustice upon me? Is this your God? Now you can understand her struggle, right? Elijah, through the God of creation, is provided, and now her most precious Possession, her son, is taken from her. But yet God, of course, performs his miracle. You see the text there. It says, bring me your son. Uh, Elijah takes the boy up to his room, which is on top of the house, lays him out there, and, of course, prays. And this is the significant thing. Go to the text, verse 20. He lays him on the bed and cries, Lord my God, have you brought tragedy even on this widow I am staying with by causing her to die? Now stop there for a moment. Remember, God has his plan of action. And God knows what he's doing, but Elijah doesn't. We have no indication that Elijah is told beforehand, now Elijah, this is what I'm going to do. The boy will die, you through my power will raise him from the dead, everything's good. It doesn't say that. So Elijah from his own heart said, wait a minute, God, 
are you just going to let this guy die and, and kind of flick this pain upon this woman? You, you brought me here. He's not getting it. And so he prays even more in verse 21. He stretches himself out of the boy three times, cries out to the Lord, Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. He prays with earnestness, desire, bring him back to life. And of course, the Lord in his power brings the resurrection. Now, as we'll see so often, is the wonderful themes of resurrection take us further to the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The picture is there. The beauty here is that God, through his power, brings the boy back to life. And I love the scene of the reunion, don't you? Verse 22, the Lord heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned to him, and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into his house, into the house. He gave him to his mother, look, your son is alive. You can imagine, you know the, the joy that comes to her. My boy's alive. It's significant to that point. Just think about that before we even move any further. God showing his great compassion through his power. His compassion to the woman. It's compassion that is even more significant because she's an outsider. He shows grace to an outsider. The widow was a Gentile. She wasn't part of Israel. It's significant in that way because in Luke's gospel, chapter 4, 24 to 26, you can read that later, Jesus there reminds them of God's grace in this way and the fact that his own people would not accept him. Because he says there about, there were lots of widows in Elijah's day in the nation of Israel, but he went to Zarephath, to the widow there, and saved her, her family. The picture again is of God's compassion, God's grace. But ultimately, of course, here is a show of his power. And that we see in the resurrection of the boy himself. Because this is of God. And I want you to see that point. Look at verse 24. Then the woman said to Elijah, this is important. Look what she says. Now I know that you are a man of God, and the word of the Lord from your mouth is truth. I want you to go back in the text and look at verse 12. When the woman is told to go make some bread, what does the woman say? As surely as the Lord, your God, lives. Here, she says, now that I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. Not the word of your Lord and God, the word of the Lord and God. Now, we don't want to read too much into this. It was a clear picture that she's come to understand the truth and faithfulness of Yahweh, the only true God. Do you see that? And she attributes this, look at, to the word of the Lord, and therefore what you speak is truth. It is only through the powerful word of the Lord that this boy is raised to life. It is an in-your-face to Baal because the true God is the sustainer, the taker, and the giver of life. Not this petty Baal God, and we'll see more of that in chapter 18, but this here is, is a wonderful reminder here that the son's resurrection confirms for the widow that Elijah is the instrument of God's power. And more important, that the prophetic word spoken is reliable. Remember we looked at last week or a couple weeks ago, that God speaks and what he speaks will happen every single time. God's word never fails to follow through. When God says something, it will happen. He will do that. And it's the key here to understand that the validity of the prophetic word, this is God's word, and it comes true. It ver verifies the prophet. That's a reminder today when people call themselves modern-day prophets and saying the world will end at this time or they'll do this or whatever. What's the one sort of earmark of a false prophet? It doesn't come true. Call yourself a prophet and say the world will end next Tuesday, as many have said. Maybe not next Tuesday, but, you know, they give a date. And what happens? That date comes and we're still here. Should we listen to that prophet anymore? Of course not. Well, I kind of got it wrong. It'll be in September. Lord, please free us from the ignorance that we have so often. The scriptures, the prophetic word comes true because this is a prophet of God. And he speaks truth. Now, the reality here, again, is something I would call a bit ironic. As Wynant writers put this, it's very interesting. He says that a Phoenician woman confesses that God speaks through Elijah, an acknowledgement that God's own people refuse to affirm. It is interesting. The people aren't paying attention. They're not listening to it. They won't affirm it. But this is 
a Gentile woman. And so the Elijah the prophet speaks. Now this is a, a, a grand picture, yes, of what God is doing, but here the point is this, that when we are called to do that which is seemingly impossible, be obedient and just watch God work. God calls us to do things that are seemingly impossible, and in a human sense, they are. There is not a sense of strength in me that can save someone from their sin. But I pray God, through the ministry of the word, save this soul or that soul. And what does God often do? Brings that to fruition. He does it through his power. He works in such a way of things impossible. When called upon to do the impossible, be obedient and watch God work. Remember, if you're a Christian here today, God has not called you to do his job. He's called you to be faithful to yours. He's not called you to save the world. He's not called you to do all these mighty acts of the Holy Spirit. He's called you to be faithful in your life to him. When we stand before him at the judgment time and when he looks at us and says, Clemens, why would I let you into my heaven? What are we going to say? All I can say is, I've got nothing except the blood of Jesus Christ on me. His righteousness. And one thing you want to know, Clemens, have you been faithful to my calling? I'll say, well, in my own strength, no, but through Christ I have. By your grace. It's faithfulness is the test. And that's what we see for Elijah here. What does Paul say in Philippians 4, 13? I can do what? Through who? I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And he's the one that receives the glory. So you see, when we talk about Elijah, we'll see so much more of him in the weeks to come, that we're reminded not so much of the greatness of Elijah at all, but the greatness of our God. Isn't that true? The stories of Elijah here and the widow of Zarephath are not to wow ourselves about the neat things that are going on here, but to cause us to bow in reverence before our sovereign God, and that he chooses to use people like us for his glory. Three things to remember as we draw to a close this morning. First is this, just like Elijah, we serve the same God. God's not any different today. He wasn't something in Elijah's day and something different now. He hasn't somehow transformed or, or morphed into something else. He's the same God, has always been, always will be. That's our God. So if that is our God, and he's done these great and marvelous things, then in some ways we need to see that in our day as well. To trust that God. Secondly, remember here that we have all of the same needs that Elijah did, and yet all of our needs are met by God himself. That everything we need, spiritually primarily, we have because the Holy Spirit dwells in us. And so we pray, Lord, feed me through your word. Feed me through the spirit. Provide for me the, the benefits of that spiritual fruit that I need so much. But in other, every, every other area of life, he provides for all our needs. Why? Because he is the true God of all things. But then this. Remember that the same powerful God that worked through Elijah is the same powerful God that has called us to be his servants. Trust in him and expect the great things that God will do for his glory. Let's not be intimidated by the world. Let's not see this pandemic as such a terrible thing. Let's see it as the opportunity God's given us to be faithful, serving him in every area. Let us get back out of this woe is me mentality and say, our God is great. And he'll do great things because he's promised to do that. He's promised to use me with all my faults to do great things for him. That means every one of you here, if you're a believer, the little ones, the big ones, God's called us to be obedient and faithful to his word, and he'll work through us. And underneath all of this, the last thing to remember here, underneath all of this is God's word and his character. The character of God that is revealed to us through his words. Let me just show you this one reality here in the text as we're going through that. Continually, it brings us back to think about the word of God. Verse 1 and 2. The Lord said... There will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except my word. Verse 2, 
Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Down to verse 14. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Verse 16, the jar of flour in there and so on, is in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken to Elijah. Now, take some time and go through all of our study in Kings and start to mark everywhere you see the word of the Lord. God says this and so on. Every time. It's all over the place. Because this isn't about Elijah. It's about God, the holy God, and his word as he speaks truth. That undergirds everything. And this is why I say this, is because so often we're told in our day that you just have to somehow to believe in yourself, your own strength, your own abilities, and whatever to get ahead of things. False teachers abound on TV that try and push us to this point. We will accomplish nothing in our own strength. It doesn't matter how much you believe. It's not going to work. It's only when we submit to the true God and have him speak through us his truth. We need that today because we call out to God like Elijah did, Lord, do your work through us for your glory. It is his power, his strength that will do great things. And in the end, he alone will receive the glory. I love Elijah. Not because he was such a great guy. I have no idea what he looked like or what his personal interests were. But man, did he ever serve a great God. And that's your God too. And he's my God. May he speak to us his word of truth today. That our lives become just that wonderful sense of God working through us. And to be with him one day in glory. And to reminisce of all the great things that God has done through us. The challenge still lies before us, folks. Let's be about God's word. His truth. That he might transform us to that which honors him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father. Uh, we spend a few minutes here in your word and many more things to learn here. We trust that you will bring them to bear upon our hearts. But this we know, Father, that you are God and you have spoken. Help our ears to be better at hearing, our minds for understanding, and our lives for obeying. Do it for your glory, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As we come to a conclusion, we'll... Have one last hymn to remind us of the amazing grace of our God, our King. Let's stand together and worship.